second. The second I start filming, people start doing stuff outside. Hello there, have you ever played a Pokemon game and thought to yourself, hmm, well that didn't make a whole lot of sense. Well good news for you, because literally everyone in the universe has thought the exact same thing. Literally everyone, except this guy. Each individual game remains essentially internally consistent. You can play one Pokemon game and understand how the lore of that game works. But then as soon as you play another game, everything starts to completely fall apart because that game's lore remains internally consistent. Yet if you compare the two, it just seems to contradict and overlap with each other, and it just makes a whole lot of nothing sense. Yeah, that was definitely the right way to construct that sentence. So I, Professor Bradley Maple, have spent countless hours researching the entire Pokemon lore through the games, through the anime, through the mangas, through the spin-offs, through the collectible trading card game, and I have figured out how the Pokemon universe works. And I'm going to tell you, using pictures and string, because everyone in life is just looking for an excuse to stick a bunch of stuff to a wall and put loads of pieces of string between it. I am going to try and accommodate for as much as the Pokemon lore as I possibly can, but there are some straight up contradictions in there that I have had to make a choice of. So there may be some things in this chart that I'm about to draw that you disagree with. That's totally fine. Go in the comments, argue your case, this is a complete clusterfuck of a tree, and only together can we solve this. And so we start. In the beginning, there was nothing. But nothing is really boring, so like, some stuff happened in it. First up, helpfully covered by that massive bit of glare, is Arceus. Arceus exists on this top layer, and stuff that's up here is what I call the Uber Gods. They are essentially all powerful beings. They have the power to create, the power to destroy, the power to bend the laws of physics to just do whatever they want. Stuff up here is the real deal. Arceus is the most obvious one, but I will argue that there are two more who go in this top category. Specifically, Necrozma and Zygarde. Arceus, Necrozma and Zygarde are the big three. They are capable of doing essentially anything, but that doesn't mean they're all the same. As is fairly expected for this kind of universe, they exist in the standard trifecta of powers. Arceus is the creation god, Necrozma is the destruction god, and Zygarde is the god of spoiling all their fun by making sure that they're in balance. So for a billion years, it's these three. Existing in the void, creating and destroying things, it's in a very unstable place because anything Arceus creates, Necrozma destroys, and Zygarde keeps that going. But then one day, for some unspecified reason, Necrozma gets banished. I'm, I'm going to stick him over here. For some reason that is unspecified for man, Necrozma pisses off these two, and that fundamentally changes the dynamic of the three uber gods. Suddenly, Arceus is given free reign to just create whatever the hell he wants, and Zygarde can only really advise him, but not stop him. Arceus starts to create things, but learns that creating things Eh, it takes a lot of effort, so he makes some friends to help him out. Arceus decides to create Palkia, Dialga, and Giratina. By the way, I'm going to pronounce these the way I think they're pronounced. If you don't like it, sorry. So here we get the first three of the Pantheon gods. You can think of this tier as being gods in the sense of Greek gods. They're still hugely powerful and have a command over a very fundamental part of nature but they don't have command over everything. These three are essentially put in charge in creating universes. Palkia is control of making sure each universe is stable with its three dimensions, Dialga keeps time flowing within them, and Giratina is responsible for the space between dimensions, the distortion world. There are some readings of Giratina that have him as the god of, like, antimatter, which A, no, and B, that's not really how antimatter works. So these two are going around doing the fun stuff, which is creating weird and wonderful universes. Uh, this is also explains how the Ultra Beasts work, because they're just from different universes. And the Distortion World isn't Ultra Space. The Distortion World is the space between different universes. Hmm. The string isn't as visible as I was hoping it would be, but I've got one day to film this. So these four go around creating stuff and Arceus eventually realises that 
creating stuff with no one to admire it is really boring, so he creates three more. So, in order to fill the universe with stuff, he makes the Lake Trio. These three are tasked with creating generic Pokémon to fill the universe. All the non-god Pokémon get put through these three, and their first attempt is Mew. So, unfortunately for Mew fans, he's going in the bottom tier, because Mew is essentially a generic Pokémon. This explains the reason that there is a slight contradiction as to who the first Pokémon is, Mew or Arceus. Mew is the first generic Pokémon. He is the common ancestor of everything that is not somewhere else on this chart. Uh, I'm using Trubbish to represent all generic Pokémon, because compared to everything else, generic Pokémon are kind of trash. Zygarde sees this whole thing going on over here, and is like, yo, that's not balanced. Creating all these Pokémon that's capable of self-reproduction? Nah, that's gonna lead to explosion. So he steps in. He creates Xerneas and Yveltal. Xerneas and Yveltal exist to promote the life cycle in Mew and all the stuff down here. They make sure that the universe stays in balance by the fact that stuff is dying and stuff is being reborn. It's worth saying now that this line in the middle is not a total coincidence. Stuff on this half is sort of Arceus born, and stuff in this half is Zygarde born. So our universe is starting to come together. We've got universes being built, Pokemon filling it, and we've got a sort of life cycle going on here. At some point in this time, these three start getting tired because they've created so much that it gets quite difficult to float around. So these three go to these three and ask for some helpers. Uh, Palkia gets Hooper, Dialga gets Celebi, Giratina gets Cosmog. Hooper puts two places in space, makes hole between them. Celebi, two spaces in time, puts them together. Cosmog, two different spaces in parallel universes, puts them together. Do you see the connection? Also, if any of you are about to comment, that's not what Celebi does. Um, I'll answer that at the end of the video, just stick with me for now. So the universe looks like this for a long time. Everything is pretty much stable, stuff's being created, dying, blah blah blah. But, in one universe, in one random corner of this whole creation, something unexpected happens. You can't see it from this, it's people. Humans happen. Humans are going in the middle, at the bottom, when technically they should probably be up here. Humans scare even the uber gods of this universe, because humans don't follow the rules that Arceus and Zygarde and Necrozma laid out. They don't have types, they communicate with words and not telepathy. They can boost the power of Pokémon, they can make generic Pokémon strong enough to bring down Titans. They are scary, and from this point explains why all of these gods, who have the whole Omniverse to play with, are all sitting on Earth, because they're keeping an eye on humans. Humans also prove that they're capable of creating Pokémon from nothing, as first demonstrated by Magirna, then Mewtwo and Genesect much later. So, humans exist, they scare them, but the Pokémon are curious enough not to just kill them. Like, thank God that Necrozma has been banished, because Necrozma would like to fuck these people up. So instead of fucking them up, Arceus essentially tries to get on their side by taking the planet that they just happened to appear from and giving it a bit of a zhuzh up. We have now broken into the third layer. The third layer is essentially what I call Titans. Pokémon that exist on this layer of the tree exist purely within the context of Earth and only exist because humans exist, but were not created by humans, they were created to serve them, essentially. It's worth saying that Pokémon on the Titan tier probably can breed and are mortal, but it's on a scale that's just so incomprehensible to humans that they're treated as if they're one of a kind. The first few rounds of Titans are Groudon and Kyogre from Arceus and Regigigas from Zygarde. So, Groudon and Kyogre exist to create land and sea to make the habitat a bit more natural, and Regigigas puts it all together into a usable shape. Eventually, Gigas realises that this is going to be a longer job than just locking them together like Lego, and it's going to require a few ages to get working, so we make some golems to manage these ages. Namely, Regice helps us through the Ice Age, Regirock helps us through the Stone Age, and Registeel helps us through the Iron Age. I swear, the more you read about the lore of Pokémon, 
the more it turns into these four being like the MVPs of Earth being livable, and humans respond by just burying them in the ground and just tarnishing them for centuries. Like, humans are kind of dicks. So after a while, a lot of land's been made, a lot of ocean's been made, Regigigas and the boys have put it all together, and Groudon and Kyogre start to sort of twig on that there's a little bit more to this whole land and sea thing than just making a bunch of stuff, so they employ some helpers themselves. So these two are essentially just normal Pokemon who happen to have really cool jobs. Groudon employs Heatran to help keep magma flowing and help keep the continental crust moving, and Kyogre hires the best legendary Pokemon to help keep the seas flowing and ocean currents and all that jazz. It keeps it together. So that's the planet, but what about weather? Both sides of the Arceus Zygarde thing create weather birds. Uh, Arceus submits Lugia, who is sort of the spawner of weather, and Zygarde creates Ho-Oh. This is a bit of a weird one. Ho-Oh is the least explained main legendary Pokemon. He only really gets that he's responsible for, like, rainbows. I've chosen to interpret that as being sort of a being of the balance of weather. Because, you know, a rainbow forms when sun and rain and wind and all that jazz has come into quite a nice harmony. You could almost argue that Ho-Oh is essentially a harvest spirit. Uh, eventually, one day, Lugia looks at this and is like, what? I want friends. So he gets some friends. Specifically, Articuno brings the cold season, Moltres brings the hot season, and Zapdos exists in the stormy seasons in between, so he technically gets twice as long as the other two, but it's... who cares about spring? So, you've got all this. All these dudes are creating the Earth, and all this creation is nice and all, but eventually you got to stop creating and start using. So what we're looking for is some kind of deity of balance. Perhaps a green snake-like god, who's a dragon, and has a prominent letter Z in their name. That's right, it's Rayquaza. I'm putting Rayquaza here, on the border between Pantheon God and Titan, because it's kind of ambiguous what he does. Rayquaza's job is essentially just Zygarde's job, but on a planetary scale rather than a universal one, which explains why they're essentially the same Pokémon, but one's in the ground and one's in the sky. So there's an argument to be made that every Pokémon in this tier should have um, a black string going between it and Rayquaza, but I'm not going to do that because I have a finite amount of string. Zygarde still ain't happy. He wants to promote not only physical diversity, but mental diversity. He creates Reshiram and Zekrom to promote differing ideologies in both people and Pokémon. Because if everyone thought the same, life would be really boring. I've put Curum here as well. Um, that's a bit of a weird one, but I have no idea where else I'd put him. The lore behind these two is interesting, because Reshiram and Zekrom are the only two pantheon gods that were created while humans were around, which is why their origin is a little bit more understood than the rest. The lore states that they were once one dragon who split which just sounds like what Zygarde is capable of doing with his cells. I personally think that original dragon that the lore speaks of is Zygarde, but there is a good case to be made that it was some intermediate step between the two. Mm, that's open to interpretation. So Reshiram and Zekrom, the yin and the yang, promote mental diversity, differing ideologies, and basically just create conflict. These two also see that everyone else has some titans to play with, um, and they get really depressed by that fact, so they create their own. You get Jirachi, Victini, Meloetta, and Shaman. They instill core values in people while being vague enough that you can have different interpretations of those core values. I've now officially run out of places to stand where I'm not covering something unless I could do this. So, this whole thing is looking really busy, really complicated, and everything is starting to come together into what we essentially see as current day Pokemon. But there's one thing we've been neglecting this whole time. While everyone's been focused on one planet in one universe, Necrozma starts sneaking his way back in, coming in through other universes, through Ultra Spaces and the Distortion World, 
and he wants revenge. Uh, while doing so, Necrozma did recruit the Ultra Beasts, which is why they are on his side, but the Ultra Beasts aren't legendary Pokémon, so I'm not including them, but he does create some of his own legendary Pokémon. He doesn't have many, because he's still relatively fresh to the whole invading the universe thing, but Zeraora, uh, the Storm Twins, Deoxys, um, Darkrai and Marshadow, they are all on his side. Uh, this is a bit of a catch-all category for legendary Pokémon that seem to exist for no other reason, just to harass people and just be dicks. Uh, there's a case to be made if you really want to give the anime a lot of credit that Darkrai should be in an upcoming category where a bunch of other Pokémon come in. Um, I personally disagree, but like, there's definitely an argument to be made that Darkrai shouldn't be in this group. It, it's complicated, this thing's already a mess. The first person to really notice this whole invasion thing that's going on is... Cosmog! Because Cosmog is chilling, like, between universes and can generally hop between them under Giratina's demand, he's the first one to really notice that, oh, the bad stuff is happening, which is why Cosmog powers himself up into Solgaleo Lunala. I don't know where to put them. <laughs> I... There we go, that works. These two come as harbingers of, yo, stuff's coming for us from other universes, we should probably be prepared for that. Arceus isn't too interested, he's kind of interested, uh, but Zygarde, Zygarde is very concerned about this, and Zygarde creates just a ton of guardians, and this is where all the rest of the legendary Pokémon come in. So in reverse generation order, the guardians are the Tapus, Volcanion, the Muscadiers, and Landorus, Cresselia, uh, Latias and Latios, the three legendary dogs, and I'm putting Melmetal here, but Pokemon Let's Go have come out to, uh, yesterday, and as far as I can tell, they don't have any sort of lore in Pokemon Let's Go, so Melmetal could go a lot of places, but I think he goes here. I, I hope he goes there, because otherwise Kanto doesn't have a Guardian, which... So this whole bottom corner is a little bit ambiguous. Um, a couple of possible ambiguities. Darkrai could go here instead of here. Sure. Also, Shaman is here. Especially when Shaman is in Sky form, she might go here. Um, that's also ambiguous. Also, Deoxys is a little bit ambiguous. Look, I'm trying really hard to make this whole thing consistent. Cut me some slack. Oh, the dogs. Um, yes. The dogs are not technically Zygarde-born, they're Ho-Oh-born, but because Ho-Oh is already Zygarde-born, I'm going to draw the line there. But these guys, these don't have one distinct origin. They're all created as guardians for different reasons, by different things. And that is it, bar one legendary Pokémon. And I challenge you, think about this whole thing. Who have I missed out? The least important legendary Pokémon ever. Um, I'm convinced they only have legendary status because they were made as a regular Pokémon and then Nintendo wanted another distribution legendary, so they just took it. It's Diane C. Diane C is just a really obscure evolution of Carbink. And that is all... 50? I didn't actually count how many there were. 63! That is all 63 legendary Pokémon explained. I'm going to get out of the way. So, I'm going to nip a few potential comments in the bud. Uh, if I don't answer your question, then feel free to drop it, because I spent way too long researching this stuff. Uh, comment 1, Celebi. Celebi is the big one people seem to get on my case for on this, because they insist Celebi has nothing to do with Dialga. Celebi exists as a forest spirit. He's a protector of the forests of Johto. And my response to that is... Kind of? Like, Celebi is a forest spirit for the same reason that Apollo is the god of Discus. Like, the same way that Apollo was really into Discus, but you don't call him the god of Discus. He's the god of music and art and whatever else Apollo did. Celebi is a subordinate of Dialga, who was given powers to help Dialga, but once the Earth was formed and Dialga stopped creating things, he just decided to take up camp in a forest. Same thing with Hooper, who just got really into stealing things, and... Cosmog regressed to being a baby again, I guess. Oh, I guess Cosmog was researching how to evolve, let's go with that. 
In fact, that's the only question I can sort of see immediately jumping out at me. Oh, I've got to take this whole thing down now. Oh, there's going to be a higher quality picture of this in the description. I'm not wearing socks.